welcome to worship this morning. Thank you for coming out on a rainy day as we gather today to commemorate the martyrdom of John Huss, which sparked uh, a big portion of the Protestant Reformation and eventually the birth of the Moravian Church. As we get to, for those who are, are viewing this in live stream or, or in a recorded format, as so uh, this is the time to kind of pause and go get uh, some bread and beverage so that you can participate with us virtually when we get to that portion of the service. Moravian Communion services are um, feature a lot of music and singing. The uh, live stream portion of this will not include screens for that, but rather give you a chance to watch the service as it unfolds. I want to share with you uh, two thank you notes that have come uh, from folks in our congregation uh, expressing their thanksgiving for prayers prayed for them during a time of physical need. Uh, the first is from Tommy Pendleton, and she writes, Dear Grace family, the outpouring of love I've received over the past three months has been overwhelming. I cannot thank you all enough for all the prayers that you have uh, gone up, for all the prayers that have gone up for my behalf. The cards and the calls that have brightened so many days for me and the emotional support given to our entire family. God bless each of you for your love and kindness. Hugs, Tommy Pendleton. And then from Lavinia McMillan. Thank you very much for your calls and cards and visits and food for me. I am most thankful for your prayers for my healing. I've missed everyone and hope to be back in church very soon. Love and blessings. Lavinia McMillan. In terms of announcements for today, there's just one to make. Our joint board meeting has been moved to tonight at 7 in the fellowship hall to accommodate a meeting I have tomorrow. So today as we worship, we continue in our series, Dear Fellow Traveler. I'll be sharing another one of the verses that have been important in my life. Today we look at John 13, verse 34 and 35. And we think about the, the uh, progression of growing ever deeper in our relationship with Jesus. Today we'll look at complexity. And what a better day to do that as we remember John Huss and his martyrdom that sparked the beginning of the P Protestant Reformation. With that in mind, it's our custom on this day to pray together the liturgy for all saints. So I invite you to stand with me as we do so on page 105 of your book of worship. Behold, a great multitude, which no one can number, out of every nation and of all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, with palm branches in their hands. And they cry with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. are the ones of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and the holes in the ground. They were stoned to death. They were sown in two. They were slain with the sword. They were burned at the stake. They were killed by the assassin's bullet. 
They were destitute, persecuted, tormented. These are the ones who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and cleansed them in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God, and they worship day and night in the temple. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd, and will guide them to springs of living water. And God shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. Almighty God, Redeemer and Sustainer, we offer you thanks and praise for the holy lives of all your servants, prophets, apostles, and martyrs who have shone forth as lights in the world and sacrificed their lives in testimony of their faith. We thank you for calling your servant John Huss to be an instrument of reformation and renewal in your church and for keeping him faithful even unto a martyr's death. We thank you for the triumphant fellowship of all the saints in glory. We remember before you all who have been called to the more immediate presence of the Savior, and especially those most dear to us in our congregation. We rejoice in your, our present fellowship with them and in our continuing hope that in the promise of eternal joy, let the great cloud of witnesses, the innumerable company of those who have gone before and entered into the rest, be to us an example of godly life. May we run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. And may we obtain entrance into your eternal kingdom and with the glorious assembly of the saints worship and adore you. who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? 
Knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. If God is for us, who can be against us? Hear the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, who was dead and is alive again. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. To Him who loves us and washed us from our sins by His blood, and made us to be a kingdom, priests to God, to Him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. it to you, O Lord. May these gifts represent our love for you, and may you use these resources to bless others. In the name of Jesus, amen. Our scripture today comes from John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. Jesus said, I give you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you, so you also must love each other. This is how everyone will know that you are my disciples when you love each other. May God bless the reading of his word. We'll go downstairs in just a minute with the children, but I don't want you to miss this because I want all of you to know on Saturday, July 23rd, we're going to have a party 
And so it's meant, it started out just for children, and we've decided to make it for all the children. That includes all of y'all, every age. It'll run from 10 to 1 p.m. There'll be a lot of games. There'll be hot dogs to eat, a lot of fun. We'll do some singing, the fun stuff we do at Campfire at Laurel Ridge, as well as, uh, you know, more thoughtful stuff. And it doubles as a way for you to have fun with me. So other than worship, it'll be my last opportunity to play with you. So come play with me. This time, those who would like to go to Children's Church are welcome to do so with Tony Ray. Come, Holy Spirit, and fill our hearts with your presence. Open our hearts and our minds to listen for your word as it speaks to us from the 13th chapter of John, verses 34 and 35. Let us lay aside those things that are a burden in this moment, the things that the plans we have for the rest of this day or maybe burdens that await us in the week ahead, and lay them all down so we can listen to you in this moment and hear your voice. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I think it's fascinating that John 13, verses 34 and 35, I think it's quoted maybe not as much as John 3, 16, but almost as much. It's a well-known passage of Scripture that so many know, but we, we rarely stop and think about the context that A, it's part of that great discourse In the Gospel of John, he devotes five chapters to what Jesus said at the Last Supper. We call that the Great Discourse. And then it happens just after Judas leaves the Last Supper dinner table to betray Jesus. Jesus is saying this in response to that moment. It's an invitation to forgiveness. It's an invitation to love each other completely. It's been a watchword for me for a very long time, and I'll say more about that in just a moment. Last week I mentioned to you that when you think about the spiritual life, we have um, a challenge to grow up spiritually. Now, whether you like it or not, I'm sure you already know this, you're going to grow older, right? You can't stay a kid. And you're going to be a teenager, and then you're going to be a young adult, a middle-aged adult, and an older-aged adult. And I'm getting used to the moving from middle to older all of a sudden. Some of you are kind of ahead of me on that account. Or you could be like Shorty Mitchell and just stay young your whole life if you choose. But spiritually speaking, you can choose to stay stunted. You can choose to be more immature spiritually than you really should be. And that is not our Moravian heritage. Our ancestors would often quote from Ephesians 4, around 11, 12, 13, 14, about growing up into the full stature of Christ. If we're going to do that and move through those stages, we're also going to move from simplicity to complexity to perplexity to harmony and back and forth a lot. And today, as we talk about John Huss, it's important to bear in mind complexity. A simple way to put it is, The great good news is that God has saved us by His gift. It's free. He's already done the heavy lifting through what Jesus did at the cross and through Easter Sunday. But it's another thing to receive that gift and live it out. Not just, you gave me the gift, now I'm going to receive it by living it out. And another thing to connect with your friends in a church setting or in the community of churches and do this together, life and grace. It gets really complicated as we try to do that. It's complicated because our Christian life doesn't stay simple. And life happens. And people pass away and we lose jobs and we lose even pets. Things that we didn't anticipate happening happen. We make mistakes. There's all kinds of hardness in this journey. But what's interesting is how grace gets even better when life gets hard. And that's part of the journey to don't just stay simple. We don't wish complexity and perplexity on anybody, but as we move into it, we learn more about who God really is and how deeply He loves us. Complexity has always been at the depth of the story in Scripture. 
that God would choose to bring Himself into this world through a teenage mom named Mary. That that would occur in a manger and not a palace. That Jesus would take 33 years, give or take, to um, live His life and in the last three years or so uh, teach 12 men and some women and a, a whole bunch of people how to be His disciples and not do it with the people we probably would have picked. The story is complex because throughout the story, they learn more when they forgive than when they win or succeed. So why do I bring all this up is because the challenge that we constantly live with is it's just so easy to turn back to what we think is simple and turn away from adversity and turn away from struggle and turn away from whatever. And every time we do that, we're choosing not to grow up. Embrace forgiveness. Don't fail to forgive. John Huss is an interesting character, and he's a great lens to bring to what I've just said. Uh, this past Wednesday, July 6th, is the day he's remembered. And most Wednesdays, I spend my time eating lunch with some younger pastors, and I, I hope I continue to be able to do that. And we were together this past week, and one of our pastors had been laid to rest, uh, Bill Campbell, on Wednesday. So some of us were at that funeral, and then we're eating lunch and talking, and we started talking about John Huss and the young pastors. I'm so um, impressed by their wisdom because it's greater than mine when it comes to uh, church history. They've gotten better instruction than, than I receive or the people before me. Uh, teachers are getting better at this. And one of them said that the rub with John Huss or the problem with John Huss is everybody in history that tried to start a revolution claimed something of John Huss. From Mussolini to Lenin to Marx to Martin Luther to Jefferson, to Ben Franklin, can pull something from John Huss. That's a lot of diversity. And yet, to the truth be known, John Huss was a stubborn cuss. He could not compromise. And had he figured out a way to compromise, I don't know that he would have worked his way out of that without getting martyred, but part of him being stubborn was part of his thing. And yet God used his stubbornness in his martyrdom on July 6, 1415 uh, to start a revolution that would lead to the Protestant Reformation. He was one of several that was part of that. Their death became a spark. What's interesting, too, is that we are one of 20-some denominations that claim their origins in John Huss. But of all those different expressions, we are one of only a few that chose pacifism at the beginning, much like the Amish and the Mennonites. Because see, that revolution that came after his death that lasted about 60 years had a lot of violence to it, Christians killing Christians. The Catholic Church wasn't terribly happy about that revolution. And other Hussites, that's what they called themselves, weren't happy with each other. So one thing we can take stock in is that for our first 275 years, we were very political, but we were political about peace, about forgiveness, and about love. The other thing that happened Wednesday is I, pres I presided over my first PC meeting as the president. We were meeting virtually, and we were signing who's going to serve on what board or commission. There's a number of them that our PC or representatives to and so to begin our time together, we asked each other, what does John Huss mean to you? And that was wonderful listening to my colleagues respond to that. Three lay people, three clergy people. A couple of things that they said is we stand in a moment in time where advocacy and care for the common people is needed as never before. I want you to think about that. Another said, what would Huss think about our reluctance as the Moravian church and Moravian congregations to adapt, to address living faith versus attachments to history and particular traditions of being a church and forgetting the people we're called to serve from time to time? I don't just think about that. But this is the one that got me from Riddick Weber, one of our professors at the seminary. Riddick was tapped by the Jamaica PC to appear Wednesday night in a virtual teaching class to teach a little bit about John Huss, and they wanted to know specifically what part of his heritage can we use for world mission and evangelism. 
And so he had prepared a couple remarks that he shared with us. One of which is, um, John Huss is known the most, perhaps, as a father of education, as one of the great contributors to public education. That was part of what got him in trouble. He thought everybody should be able to come to church and hear the Scripture read in their language, sing hymns in your language, hear the sermon in your language. That was not happening in the late 1300s. And it, it went on to be a thing where he wanted everybody, uh, particularly common people, to have access to school and education because he thought literacy was the best way to put an end to war and pestilence and disease. If people could learn. But Riddick went on to say he was just as concerned about the culture of people. We, we love language, but do we really love culture? Do we really care about the people who are younger than 40? who aren't at church because they've been wounded by some of the things we've said and thought. Maybe not Grace Moravian people, but Christians in general. That audience is getting bigger. They think we're hypocrites. If we're to honor John Huss, we need to take seriously the culture of the people immediately around us. Riddick went on to say, are we concerned about dismantling our caste system? That was a bigger thing in Huss's day. But, you know, there's some people that kind of get to enjoy the best of the American dream, but there's a whole lot of people that are just having a hard time staying employed or being gainfully employed or even paying for insurance and things like that. Those are the people John Huss cared about. As he's trying to translate this for the Jamaica PEC, one of the things he said is, are we concerned about people worldwide who do not have access to clean water or farms to feed their families or just a living wage? And finally, Riddick said, we could be Rome. The time the church and John Huss Day was a reflection of the Roman Empire. They looked one and the same, and church was an empire. It wasn't much about ministry to people. And when we confuse what we want in life in terms of like material things with the gospel, that's exactly what we're doing. We're making the gospel Rome again. We're called to be different than that. We're reminded that in the first 275 years of the Moravian Church following John Huss' example, we were not apolitical. They didn't put him to death for being apolitical. They put him to death because he called for a reformation, for living the Christian faith. So back to John 13, verses 34 through 35. I found it to be a watchword in my life from an early, early age, probably the earliest I can remember, maybe the age of seven. And it's been a lens throughout my life. So you can't say this about all Scripture, but some Scripture you can. I had a great professor at Mars Hill who, you know, anything Jesus said from the cross, you've got to take as the highest possible, most serious Scripture and if you're using Scripture as a weapon against somebody, does it pass the seven last words test? Because it can't contradict what Jesus is saying from the cross. You can use John 13, 34 through 35 the same way. If it doesn't lead to others seeing love in you, then you probably have misinterpreted it. If it leads to love, especially forgiveness and unconditional love, then you're probably getting it right. But more importantly, it's not about something we describe verbally. It can be. It's more about what we do with our feet and with our hands. I got to attend my pilgrimage weekend in February 2013. I've mentioned before that I went on such a weekend because of a member of our church at the time uh, was just at the end of his rope. His wife had died suddenly from an accidental overdose and Two and a half years later, he was so bereft with grief, he could not see how to live the next day. So Tom Cooper convinced me if I went with my friend to a weekend, that would help my friend. And on the way to the weekend, I realized the wife that passed away was my first babysitter. I did not even know that to that moment. And maybe you're like me. When you suddenly realize a coincidence like that, you realize it isn't a coincidence that something great's about to happen. This verse, John 13, 34, and 35, was the keynote for that whole weekend. And I remember the symbol of the weekend was two nails laid together to make a cross, and then interlaced was a heart. 
And I saw it throughout that week in, in different ways. It, at one point, they actually built this incredible luminary thing that was about 65 yards long and 45 yards wide with that heart laced in it. And I could hear God saying to me, I'm going to get ready to prepare you to look like this, to give you a big heart. Now, I don't think God breaks our heart to make a point. I think God calls us to follow, and on the way, the consequences of saying yes is your heart gets broken from time to time. If you live for love and you live forgiveness, not everybody's going to like that. And it was unbelievable the things that came next. But guess what happened? My heart got bigger. It brought me back to you. I want you to take this passage over the next couple of weeks and really ponder it and think about it and where it might call you. Uh, I'm, I'm inviting our joint board, and we'll talk about this a little bit tonight, to really get, let it be the guiding force of what they do as they plan and move forward into the future. Let God lead you, but it's not going to be simple. The consequences of following are going to be complicated, but the outcome's going to be worth it. This lens helps me a lot to think about John Huss and, and why he was so stubborn about certain things, certain things that cost him his life because he was stubborn. We do get to gather and hear a preacher preach a sermon in the language that you understand. Because he cared about this, we get to hear Scripture read in our language and we get to sing hymns. He was one of the first people to advocate hymns. We get to see art in the church. He was an advocate of that. We also get to come to the table and drink from the cup. Back then, it had been 400 years since the laity were allowed to drink from the cup. This is probably the one thing that got him in the most trouble. Because he did not see clergy as above the people, but among the people. Set apart, but not different than. Because we are a priesthood of believers. As you partake at the table today, remember that. This is actually the earliest symbol of our church. Not the lamb, but the chalice. Because we are one at the Lord's table. I said to you back at Easter something that, that I had just come to realize uh, with the help of a teacher that I want to uh, draw a, a remembrance to in this moment. When Jesus rose from the dead, it's Easter morning, other than the few people he met in that garden where he meets his disciples in, as a group is right here. At the same table they were at on Maldi Thursday. It's the same table they were at on Pentecost Sunday. It's the same table he calls you to today. May you hear his call. As we pray and Prepare ourselves for communion. Allow the music of the choir to lead you.
Please join me on page 27 of the supplement to the hymnal as we celebrate Holy Communion in celebration of unity and renewal. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Thanks be to God. As we stand to sing together, we exchange the right hand of fellowship. You can literally do that or fist pump or just uh, nod at somebody depending on what you're comfortable with. But let us stand as we greet each other as a sign of our willingness to forgive each other. Lord, we ask your presence to be on this cup and this bread that they represent your presence among us. May you use this meal to bless us, not just physically, but spiritually, that as we partake of the bread and cup, we become more like you, and we truly are the people of God. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. On the night in which our Lord was betrayed, he took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take ye, this is my body, which is broken for you and for many, and, and for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. You may be seated.
Lord Jesus Christ said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. In the same way, after supper, our Lord took the cup. He gave thanks, and then he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this all of you, for this is my blood, the blood of a new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. You may be seated. <laughs>
Our Lord Jesus Christ said, Drink from this, all of you, but do this whenever you do so in remembrance of me. Christ, the Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant to us your peace. Amen. drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he come. Once again, we share the right hand of fellowship as a signal of our willingness to serve the Lord as one. bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.